Last song we sang, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Do you believe that this morning? That's okay if you don't believe that. It's okay if you don't. My prayer is that during the course of this morning that you will believe that, that in some way, shape, or form, the Spirit will touch you and, and convince you of that truth because it is a truth. No matter what we think or believe, it is a truth. Um, and my prayer is that you would come to believe that this morning and that it would sink deep in your hearts and deep in your minds and it would guide you every day of your life. So let's, let's uh, we've got a lot to cover this morning. I know it's a short little section that we have but there's a ton in it so let's go ahead and pray and we'll jump right in Lord God I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word please sink these truths deep Lord that we might be guided by you that we might realize your power and how it just can change our lives Jesus name I pray Amen. Amen. When I was a kid, if I, if, uh, if I told my grandmother that I wasn't feeling well, and I think I've shared this before, if I told her I wasn't feeling well, the first question in her little diagnostics usually were, well, when's the last time you used the bathroom? When, when, she would say, when's the last time you had a, 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 a BM? And I would be like, well, like, why are you even asking that of me? And she would, she would tell me kind of in a funny way, she would say, well, when you're as old as my, I am, you will come to appreciate healthy bowel movements. <laughs> and and uh, honestly, apart from conversations that I had with her when I was a kid, uh, I don't much think about the health of my bowel movements one way or the other, other nowadays. So, so maybe I do take them a little for granted. She didn't want me to. But we, we take a lot of things for granted. And, and the problem is, is we don't know what we take for, for granted, usually until it's gone. And this, this happens a lot when you get older. You don't realize that, that you, you took your fast and youthful metabolism for granted until it slows down and you put on a couple of extra pounds. You, you, you're right? You don't realize you took your youthful, well-oiled joints for granted until they're not so youthful or well-oiled and they creak and they pop and they hurt. You usually don't take those things for granted until you miss them. Eyesight, hair, teeth, I've still got all those. All things you don't realize are so important until they're gone. All things we tend to take for granted until they're gone. In this country... There are a lot of things we take for granted that I hope we don't ever have to learn that we take for granted when they're gone. Water. As easy as going to the faucet and and turning a little knob and the cup fills up. Something that in other countries represents hours of labor, we can get with ease. About seven months ago, many people learned that they took the ready availability of toilet paper for granted. Remember the shelves were empty? Do you remember that? When people were hoarding that stuff? Hand sanitizer, bleach, rubbing alcohol, all things that we took for granted until we weren't able to buy them. Relationships with people. When one ends unexpectedly, there are all kinds of ways that you miss them. And you really didn't realize that you took them for granted until they're gone. I would give a ton just to be able to tell my grandmother about my bowel movements nowadays. Just because I miss her that much. I didn't realize how important those conversations were until they were gone. So often it isn't until things are gone that you realize just how much you took them for granted. God was with his people. Think about that for a second. The the being who made all of creation, the heavens, the earth, the stars, the sun, the water, animals, people, everything you can imagine, that being, God, was with his people. 
the infinite source of all power in the entire universe, the most holy God, was with his people. The God who is not bound by time or space, who isn't constrained by temporal constraints of this world, bound himself to a time, a place, and a particular people, the Israelites. God was with his people. That's what the ark of God represented. And I want to spend just a few minutes setting the stage for what the ark was because it will really help us as we explore this text. And I'm not talking about what it looked like or even what was within it. Those things are important things to know. I'm more interested in the purpose for the reason the ark was given to Israel. The ark was the place where God's presence was located for the people of God. 2 Samuel 6, 2. Uh, this is, you know, fast forwarding into the future. David brings all the young men of Israel together. There's about 30,000 of it. And in 2 Samuel 6, he and all his men, we are told, go to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty. And then Samuel 6, 2 says this, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. Psalm 99.1 says this, says the Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, let the earth shake. Going back in time, number 7, verse 89 says that when Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the atonement cover on the Ark of the Covenant Law. In this way, the Lord spoke to him. In Exodus 25, we get a, a great description of what the ark looked like. It was covered with gold. There's cherubim on top. It's got, I mean, it's, it's a really nice thing. But we get this long description. And then at the end of Exodus 25, uh, verse 21 and 22, we see this. It says, God is telling Moses, place the cover on top of the ark. Put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law that I will give you. There above the cover... Between the two cherubim that are over the Ark of the Covenant Law, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. Those texts basically spell out that this is where the people of God can come to God through his priests and be in the presence of God to be shaped by his direction, to be guided by his wisdom. Now, there's a lot going on in the Old Testament up until this point. But the underlying thread, if I had to pick one, was that God calls together a people for himself, and then he is with his people. He's there to guide his people, to give them what they need, to protect them. You can find that in story after story in the Old Testament, in the pages of Scripture. There's a pillar of fire and a, and a pillar of a cloud that guides them. Miraculous works that save them. Story after story. The Israelites had that. He was with them. But they took it for granted. Their understanding of how precious what they had just leaked away. They lost sight of what that meant for their lives. They gave up the glory of God for things that were a poor replacement. They had everything that they would ever need, more than they would ever need, to live lives of beauty and goodness right before them. If you're a Christian, you have everything you will ever need. To live a beautiful and good and fulfilling life. You have it. And we can learn to be reminded from this text this morning of this truth. So we don't lose sight of that. Now if you're, you're here listening, you know, if you're here today, if you're listening online, if you're not a Christian, you may be confused right now. You may even be skeptical of, of what I just said. And that's okay. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're listening. I'm glad you're tuned in. It means that you're seeking. You're looking for something. 
And I hope and pray that you will see, as we go through this text this morning, that the answer you're looking for, that you will ever need, is found in God. If you're a Christian, and if you're wondering, what the heck am I talking about? If your first response was, I don't have everything that I need, then I hope you'll, you'll bear with me, because I think this text can help you see it a little clearer. Now, we learn two things from what went wrong with the Israelites in this text. We learn that they didn't humble themselves before God, and they didn't cultivate life in his presence. And if we take that and, and, and put it into our lives, we can learn from that. On the surface, as you read this, this account, on the surface, it's, it's a little strange. It's a little weird because it seems so counter to what we expect. The, the Israelites seem to have faith in God. They seem to be operating under principles of faith, but God lets them down. That's what it seems like, right? So the Israelites, they go, they go up against the Philistines. They're, they're perennial enemies. They go up against the Philistines to fight them. They're defeated in battle. They lose about 4,000 fighters. They go back. They say, what happened? They, they take the, you know, the ark of God. They take God with them into battle. And there's this great uproar because they've got this faith. They know that God's with them. They're going to win. They're going to, they're going to fight. And they're going to destroy the Philistines. In fact, they are so convinced the Philistines actually think they're going to get destroyed. They're like, oh, man. They've just brought the God, their God into the gods, they say plural, into the camp, and, and we're going to be destroyed. We better fight hard or we're going to lose. And everything is pointing that direction. God is with them. They are confident. They have faith. And they go back to battle, and they lose. Worse than they did before. They went from losing 4,000 to 30,000 is what we're told. They're obliterated. And you might ask, like, what, is, what, is, what in the world is happening here? They went into battle without God, lost 4,000. Then they went in with God, they lost 30,000. What's going on? Earlier accounts, whenever the Israelites took God into battle with them, they won. They defeated their enemies. Think about Gideon. Think about Moses. Think about Joshua. So why didn't it work in this account? And here's why. It is related to their hearts. It is related to their orientation towards God. Notice something that is missing throughout this entire account. If you have your Bibles, it would be helpful to turn to it. Notice something that's missing in this entire account. Not once do they ask God what he wants. They never incline their hearts to seek God. In verse 3, after the first defeat, the elders ask each other why the Lord brought defeat upon them. But there's no mention of actually going to God to figure out what went wrong. They never ask him. They even recognize that God is bringing judgment upon them. But they never do the hard work of bending themselves to God, of coming before him humbly, no matter how hard it might be. To hear why God's judgment has come down. That's all the more apparent when you compare what is happening here in this account with another account of Israel's defeat earlier in, in their history. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Joshua chapter 7. It's almost a, an exact same thing. In Joshua 7, the Israelites have entered into the promised land, the, the, the land that God had promised them. They have come up against this mighty city, the city of Jericho. They take the ark of God into battle with them. They do these, these, these instructions that God gives them, this miraculous thing. The walls come crashing down. God has worked supernaturally to defeat the city of Jericho. The Israelites have won. Everything is great. They're feeling really full of themselves. They're ready to go kick some more butt in battle. And they go. They send spies to this little, this little backwater town of Ai. And when the spies return, they tell Joshua, listen, this is a little podunk town, and it's ripe for picking. There is no way they can stand against us. In fact, they are so weak, we don't even need to send the whole army after them. 
we can just send 3,000 men to go take this, this city. So Joshua sent 3,000 men to fight against just a few men that were told in the text. 3,000 versus just a few. It seems like that's a pretty sure thing. Pretty good odds, but what happens? The few men beat back the 3,000, totally defeating them. The Israelites lose. And when this happens, the people are fearful. They melt away. But here, here this story is different from what happens in 1 Samuel. Their response is totally different. And this is what I want us to pay attention to. So if you read Joshua 7, starting in verse 6. Then Joshua, so this is after the defeat. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Remaining there until evening. The elders of Israel did the same. And sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, oh, Sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites, to destroy us. If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? I mean, Joshua the leader and the elders, the other leaders, come before God and just laid out before the ark in mourning and asking what is going on. It's, it's a picture of humility, of heartbrokenness, of, of seeking God. And as they lay out before Joshua, or as Joshua and the elders lay out before the ark, they receive the answer. Picking up in verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. God answers when they ask. The Israelites figure out what's wrong. It's not an easy thing. If you read the rest of that account, it's, it's pretty, like, it's pretty scary. The problem is sin in their midst, a rebellion against what God has asked them to do, and they have to do the hard work of humbling and conforming themselves to God. They repent and work it out. Then they are able to defeat Ai. But in our text this morning, the leaders, the elders... We don't see any hint of that. They don't come before God to seek why. They recognize his judgment, but they don't pursue repentance. They just think that they can force God into acting on their behalf. Which makes sense when you look at the other mistakes that they make. The other mistake that they make is that they haven't cultivated a life in God's presence. God is with his people. And yet the people aren't really with God. The spiritual temperature best taken through the priests, Phineas and Hophni. And we learned a few weeks ago how they were oriented toward the Lord. If you remember back from to, to 1 Samuel chapter 2, the description of Eli's sons, Phineas and Hophni, were that they were wicked man, men... And that they had no regard for the Lord. They had the privilege of leading God's people before the Lord. To be shaped by his presence, yet they had no regard. And the very people who should have been leading the people to luxur luxuriate in the presence of God. Lead them into contempt and falsehood. Which lead the Israelites into the worshiping of idols. And I know it doesn't say anything about it explicitly in our text this morning. Anything about idol worship. I think we get a little hint because the Philistines, the Philistines they see the Israelites uh, bring in the ark and they, 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 they talk about plural gods. And so they recognize that Israel worships other gods. But if you look at 1 Samuel 7, 3, when Samuel later on in life uh, calls the people to return to God with their whole hearts, 
He tells them that they should turn away from worshiping the false gods. In Psalm 78, verses 56 through 64, it also spells out what's wrong during this time. And the, and the big thing that's wrong, the reason for God's judgment, according to Psalm 78, is that the people are worshiping idols. So rather than being satisfied with the worship of one true God, they're seeking all kinds of other gods. And this affects how they interact with God. They see God as just another idol, as one of the gods to be used for their own end that will help them gain victory in battle. And they seek to use God as just another of the gods. Richard Keyes, in an essay from the 90s called The Idol Factory, pointed out that the gods of the ancient Near East were a way for people to feel they had a control. If you need a good harvest, give grain to the god of harvests, and you could control something that felt uncontrollable. Need a baby? Give an animal to the god of fertility, and you felt like you had some kind of control over something uncontrollable. Need victory in battle? Just carry the god of the battle of, ho- of the hosts of battle in with you. These gods were gods to be manipulated in order to gain control over life. And the Israelites have let the culture around them shape how they relate to God. And they treat him as just as if he's just another one of the gods. They take the ark into battle, fully believing that if they just carry it into battle, just carry this box into battle, then God will have to give them victory. But God is more than just a superstitious talisman. He isn't controlled by mankind. I remember years ago I was working a shooting as a trooper in Virginia. And I was, um, I, I was called to an accident. And basically what had happened is these two guys that were arguing over territory for selling drugs... They got in an argument, and one guy pulled out a gun, the other guy jumped in his car and ran from him, and then the other guy jumped in his car and and chased him. And they got up on the interstate, and they're driving right beside of each other, and this guy starts shooting into this guy's car. Um, He loses control because he took took his hands off the wheel and he wrecked, and this guy keeps on going. And so I get to work an accident, and in the midst of working the accident, I realize it's a shooting, and the victim has come back, and the guys that were in the other car fled. Long story short, the guy that got shot at um, when I'm interviewing him, he is like, he is worked up. And he just keeps telling me, he's like, this isn't the first time that I've been shot at. This isn't the first time I've been shot at. I, he's like, I cannot be killed. And I'm like, I'm like, that is very interesting. And he said, you know why I can't be killed? And I'm like, I don't. Please tell me. And he, and he pulled this necklace out of his shirt. And on it was a cross. And he said, this is why. Because I carry mother F and God with me. That's what he said. And this was a gift that was given to him from his grandmother. He had no faith apart from just this, this, in this trinket. And he was convinced that it would save him. But God isn't controlled. God isn't controlled by men. Not by jewelry, not by an ark. God is not controlled by men. And that's a hard lesson to learn. But it's one that God teaches them. They are defeated and they are scattered, and the priests, Phineas and Hophni, are killed. And we knew that was coming because God's been saying that for a while now in this, in this book. And the ark of God is captured. The Israelites haven't humbled themselves before God. And they've neglected to cultivate a life immersed in God's presence. Can we learn from them? I remember as a young kid hearing stories of of archaeologists that were searching for the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant. And and, and as a kid, that that has like a certain aspect of romance to them, especially when you pair it with a movie 
um, called Raiders of the Lost Ark. Do you guys remember that movie? Like, which was all about looking for the lost Ark of the Covenant. There was Indiana Jones who was looking for the Ark. And then there were the Nazis looking for the Ark too. And Indiana Jones was looking for the Ark to keep the Ark out of the Nazis' hands. The Nazis were looking for the Ark because they wanted the power the talisman. They wanted the power that was contained in the ark so that they could be indestructible in battle. They wanted to weaponize it. And the, and the popular belief, even if you watch those like old documentary, historical documentaries of the search for the, the ark, is there's always this underlying assumption that there's power directly in the ark, in the relic. That the ark contained power. And it captured my imagination as a kid when I was younger, but then I realized something. That power, that same power and presence of God, it wasn't with the ark. If you are a Christian, and this is what I, if you haven't heard anything else, if you are a Christian, then you believe that God is with his people. Not in the form of his presence on the mercy seat or the atonement seat of the ark, but in the presence of his son Jesus Christ. And that through Christ's work, his death and resurrection, his presence now lives within you. God came to dwell with his people in Jesus Christ. And for a period of time was literally God among us, Emmanuel. God among us. He ministered, it was crucified, and he resurrected. And then he ascended to heaven and sent his spirit. His spirit that lives in every believer. Isn't that something that's pretty amazing? How often do you think about that? That presence that if the priests didn't didn't make themselves holy enough, that they stepped into that presence, it would kill them dead. That presence that if only certain people at certain times of year were allowed to stand before it, would kill them dead? That power? The creator of the universe, the one who made the stars and the skies, the heavens and the earth and the water and the animals and everything you can imagine, that being, God, is with his people. Through his spirit is with his people. As Paul writes in Ephesians 1 and Romans 8, it's the same power That raised Christ from the dead. That resurrection power is with God's people. If you're an amen or you should amen at that. If you're not, you should amen at it anyway. Have you ever just thought about that? That is amazing. I I fear sometimes that as a church we've lost sight of that. That God is just this distant Being that has nothing to do with us. And we learn throughout scripture that God is with us. Empowering us. Empowering us to fight sin. Empowering us to do good. Empowering us to do great works. Can we learn from the Israelites? God's presence was with the Israelites. But they gave it up. They misused it. They misunderstood it. They ignored it really. They turned out idols to to other gods. that, That aren't anything. They took it for granted, and we can too if we don't learn. Do you humble yourself before God? The very first step of becoming a Christian is rooted in humility. In Acts 2, Peter preaches this powerful sermon, and the people are cut to their core. And at the end of that sermon, the people are torn, and they ask him, what should we do? What should we do? And Peter tells them, repent. Turn away from your own ways and turn to the ways of God. In Acts 16, this jailer comes trembling to Paul and he asks him, what must I do to be saved? And Paul's answer is very simple. There's nothing you can do to be saved. He says this, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. It's not what the jailer can do. It's what Jesus has done. He just has to believe. This is a profound work of humility, of acknowledging the powerlessness of ourselves to save ourselves. 
It is at once the easiest and the hardest because it consists in bowing our knee and submitting ourselves to God. And that can be a painful process sometimes. Romans 10, 9 says this, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So much of life is spent doing things. We have to work hard to earn a living, earn a degree, gain a following, earn a reputation, earn, earn, earn. It's really hard for us to believe that the thing of highest value in this world isn't about earning. It's about what has been earned for us. And the only thing we have to do is submit to him. To confess Jesus as Lord and and Savior, believing that he has done the work for us. And then shaping our lives to that confession. It's a lifelong work. Don't get me wrong. It's a lifelong work of cultivating his presence. Luxuriating in the truth of what he has done of his work. It is a daily discipline of spending time with him. In his presence. Seeking him. Being with him. Not just putting him on the shelf and pulling him out when you need something. Do you only seek him when you need something? Want that job? Let's pull God off the shelf and pray. Want that mate? Let's pull God off the shelf. Want to break free from some sin that's breaking in your life? Let's just dust God off for this moment when I'm struggling with that thing. If you bring God off the shelf just when you need him, every once, you know, twice a year maybe, you run the same risk the Israelites ran. He may leave you high and dry, teach you, a, teach you something, teach you a lesson. If you're trying to break free of some kind of sin, but you haven't been cultivating a life with him, then you are going to be spinning your wheels. Years ago, Howard Hendricks did a study on Christians who had adulterous affairs. There were four things that were semi-common among all of those Christians, like 264 of them, Christian men. And an elaborate questionnaire where he determined, okay, I think these guys are all, as best as I can determine, they're all Christians. There were four things that they did, most of them. Of those four, there was one thing that every single one of them did. Every single one of them did this. They did not cultivate their relationship with God. Garrett Kell writes this about that study. Somewhere along the line, each of the men in the study began to drift. Prayers became less passionate. The promises of God and his word grew dusty. Love for Jesus became something spoken of in the past tense. There is no sweeter assurance of help than Christ Jesus the Lord. He stands ready at God's right hand to supply the grace and mercy we need. Do not allow your hearts to grow cold toward the Lord who loves you so. Draw near to him daily, moment by moment, and hopeful expectation that he is better than any fleeting pleasure that might entice your heart. Do not seek him only in the days of desperation, but seek him daily. Walk with him. Rekindle passion. Plead with him to help you. He is able to do it, and he delights to do it. We have the promise of God's presence with us. We have the promise of God's presence in us. It's a power that changes lives. It helps us to break free from bondage. It helps us to break free from captivity. It is the power to set us free. Jesus calls us into a relationship with him. Are you willing to give up your control? Are you willing to humble yourselves to him and spend your life cultivating that relationship in his presence. I think. No, I know. That you will find some amazing things. If you do. Pray with me. Lord, help us to humble ourselves. Before you.
Help us to understand that we aren't God, you are. And bow before you. Help us to cultivate a life in your presence, Lord. Seeking to be in relationship with you. Seeking to follow you. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we go here from here today. That you would guide us and direct us and shape us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.